Good morning, everyone. I'm Susan Wagner. I'm a trustee from the Chicago, Illinois area. And I know that 9 o'clock Sunday morning being dressed in a conference hall is not necessarily de rigueur. But if you concentrate, you can imagine that you're at home in your PJs watching the news shows. In fact, let, re let me remind you once again that the session is being broadcast live on the internet. It has become standard for each successive administration to say that U.S.-Israel relations have never been closer. What that means in practice differs over time, however. The same president who embarked on a daring plan to rescue thousands of Ethiopians and bring Ethiopian Jews and bring them to Israel, a plan that had little connection to U.S. strategic interest, was also the president who has gone down in history as having one of the most difficult relationships with Jerusalem. That was the first President Bush. And the president who opposed one Israeli strategy after another, from Israel's decisions to open talks with Bashar al-Assad, to Israel's requests for advanced bunker-busting bombs, to Israel's preference that Washington attack the Syrian nuclear plant, was the president who has gone down in history as having one of the closest relationships with Israel, and that was the second President Bush. Today, our two countries face what could be the most serious and profound set of common challenges in the history of our relationship. That list begins with the Iran nuclear challenge. It extends to the fundamental changes in Arab states over the past year, what many Arabs call the Arab Spring. And it ends up in the narrower confines of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And as Washington and Jerusalem work through their own sometimes tense relationship in dealing with these issues, they do so at a time when here at home, the basis of the relationship has come under attack, with critics arguing that if Israel ever was an asset to the United States, it is no more. Rather, they argue that it is a strategic liability. So in the era of what we've been calling here the new, new Middle East, is Israel an asset or liability to the United States? And how will the answer to that question affect the way the two sides address the lengthy list of problems on their common agenda? To answer these questions, we are delighted to bring together a panel of truly wise men. Robert D. Blackwell, has spent a lifetime committed to the advance of American interests, first in the Foreign Service, then as a higher level policymaker, as arms control negotiator, as ambassador to India, and eventually as presidential advisor. He is currently the Henry A. Kissinger Senior Fellow for U.S. Foreign Policy at the Council on Foreign Relations. We are especially proud that he is co-author with Walter Slocum of one of our most important publications, a 2011 study titled Israel, a Strategic Asset for the United States. Our second panelist is Dennis Ross. I think it is fair to say that no person has been closer to the making of U.S. Middle East policy over the last 20 years than Dennis. His service on the National Security Council began as senior director in the Reagan administration and ended as senior director in the Obama administration. In peace and war, diplomacy and conflict, Dennis has been a trusted advisor to presidents of both parties. He was the author of the Washington Institute's first policy paper 27 years ago, and we are so proud that he is now back with us as counselor, Dennis. And if we had to pick one Israeli to join these two accomplished Americans, we could not be blessed more than with a finer, more with a finer scholar statesman than General Amos Yadlin. In his 40 years in uniform, Amos contributed to Israeli national security from just about every angle. From his service as an Air Force pilot 
to his role as head of Israel's Defense Intelligence Agency. His exploits are legion, especially in what we can call creative counterproliferation. We are proud that when he left the IDF, Amos' first stop was an eight-month stint as the Washington Institute's K Fellow in Israeli National Security. Since then, he has taken the directorship of Israel's prestigious Institute of National Security Studies. Amos. And leading the discussion is our own David Makovsky, the, the award-winning former journalist who serves as our Ziegler Distinguished Fellow and Director of the Project on the Middle East Peace Process. David, to you, and thank you. Thank you, Susan, and good morning, everyone. Hope you can hear me in the back. I, um, look, it's a sign of the times that an issue that is often occupied center stage at our conference, U.S.-Israel relations, has not been the center stage this time. Uh, I would say that it's a function of the tumultuous times we're going through in the Middle East, probably the most tumultuous time since the collapse of the Ottoman Empire in 1917. Uh, and it's also maybe a function of uh, an American and now an Israeli election year that tends to eclipse policy issues. Uh, so we're in an interlude period that, um, where this issue is not the centerpiece as it has been in the past, but it's still a very important issue for us at the Washington Institute. So, you know, we've been hearing about different files, different countries, whether it's uh, Iran, whether it's Egypt, whether it's Syria, and all the problems in every one of these issues. Now we get to U.S.-Israel relations. Is this issue a problem? Um, I'd like to divide it up by more looking where we're at now and, and looking back. And, uh, and then go forward by talking about it, the Iran issue and the impact on the Arab Spring. But before we get to those issues, just in terms of you know, where we are now, as, uh, looking back and looking at the present, is U.S.-Israel relations, um, is there a real problem here? Is Israel an asset to the United States, a liability to the United States? Uh, as Susan noted, uh, Bob, co-authored with Walt Slocum, uh, a monograph on this issue for us. So maybe to be our lead-off batter this morning, Bob could give, a, give us a sense of his thesis. Bob? Thank you very much, David. And uh, it's good to be here again, uh, not least because I think that the Washington Institute is uh, the best think tank in the world on issues of the greater Middle East. I don't think any other uh, research, any other research uh, and writing institution uh, reaches its depth and breadth of analysis. Uh, and I separate that from advocacy where other, some other think tanks uh, have a distinct advantage. Um, what I'd like to do is tell you briefly the backstory of this uh, essay that Walt Slocum and I wrote. Walt, I think, many of you know, was uh, for eight years the Undersecretary for Policy in the Clinton administration. And I'm a uh, rock-ribbed Republican from western Kansas. I think I saw my first uh, Democrat when I was about 18 years old. <laughs> so uh, uh, when I went to Rob uh, Satloff about a year ago and said I wanted to examine the issue in an analytical way of whether Israel was a strategic asset to the United States, uh, we recruited Walt uh, to help, and he's a brilliant, brilliant lawyer, and also uh, smarter than about anybody on these matters. So uh, we set out first to do some research, and I, this will be epigrammatic, I apologize, uh, to get through it quickly. Uh, I noticed there's some copies of the report out on the table. It's on both the Institute's and the Council on Foreign Relations website if uh, you want to have a look at it. Well, the first thing we did was a research endeavor, which was to look at what policymakers, uh, folks in Congress, and so forth, uh, had said about the U.S. Israeli relationship. And we discovered that uh, two major themes were persistent. Uh, and uh, should have been, 
those are you know, familiar to you all, democratic values and the moral responsibility that the United States has in defending uh, the, uh, the Jewish state. What we didn't find, and as I say, I was, uh, this was a, a genuine investigation, I was surprised that the issue of uh, Israel and America's national security interests was not one of the pillars of the explanation of the relationship. Only rarely was Israel uh, as a strategic asset for the United States and its national interest ever mentioned. So Walt and I decided to examine that. Uh, and um, what I had thought innocently was that I would just Google Israel's uh, contribution to American national interest, and there'd be a nice list there, and I could footnote it. No such list existed. So Walt and I spent four months uh, uh, accumulating this list, which I will share very briefly with you, but is in great detail uh, in, in the report. And uh, so let me start uh, in this way by saying that uh, after six months of deliberation, we concluded that Israel is a strategic asset of the United States and we make that argument in a detailed way in the report. And again, I apologize for the brevity, but first, there's no country in the Middle East uh, and few countries in the world in which the national interests of the two countries are so aligned as with United States and Israel. And uh, I won't go through those vital national interests, but uh, they are nearly identical. And of course, that's not true of any country other country in the Middle East, and not so many countries around the world. Now, uh, Israel's contribution to U.S. vital national interests uh, are, is in counterterrorism cooperation, tactical intelligence, experience in uh, urban warfare, which sadly the United States has had to engage in in the last decade. Uh, we use Israeli technology not just on missile defense, but a variety of other ways. Uh, to uh, enhance our military capability uh, and so forth. As I say, I'm not going to go into that uh, in detail. But I do want to make one point here as a rock-ribbed Republican. Uh, I'm not uh, enthusiastic about some dimensions of President Obama's policies toward Israel. And uh, to paraphrase Henry Kissinger, Barack Obama was my second choice uh, in the last presidential election. But to be fair, to be fair, uh, the, in the last, now uh, heading for four years, the U.S.-Israel defense and intelligence relationship has gotten stronger and stronger and stronger through the efforts of the Obama administration, and I think it deserves credit in that regard. Of course, the gentleman sitting on my immediate right is not entirely uh, disassociated with that evolution. But anyway, I thought it was necessary to say. So let me uh, now uh, uh, give you uh, just this thumbnail sketch of history about Israel's contribution to American vital national interests. 1966, Israel acquires a MiG-21 from Iraq, and to remind you, in 1966, and passes it on to the United States, the MiG-21 was uh, the first line aircraft on the central front when we were very much worried about a Soviet invasion across the inner German border. In 69, the Israelis uh, were man managed to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, steal, I believe is the technical word, from Egypt an advanced uh, Soviet, the most advanced Soviet air defense uh, uh, radar. In 1970, as we know, the Israelis uh, uh, mobilized and essentially stopped this severe Syrian invasion of Jordan. Uh, of course, we have the 1973 war, which uh, one of the net uh, effects of that was to expel the Soviet Union from the Middle East, essentially, uh, a situation uh, that uh, uh, remains uh, the case to this day. Or to put it differently, think what the Middle East would look like if Israel had lost that war. Uh, the destruction of the uh, 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 Sirach radar uh, reactor in 1981, the Egypt-Israel peace treaty, the uh, 
uh, Israel-Jordan peace treaty, which of course are two of the anchors of our Middle East policy, the destruction of the Syrian nuclear facility in 2007, the Israeli commitment to two-state solution with the Palestinians, and two that are not always remarked on in which Israel did not act. One was, of course, the Israeli decision not to attack Iraqi scuds during the first Gulf War, which would have, of course, shattered the, uh, the Western coalition, and uh, the decision by Israel uh, not to continue to transfer sensitive technology to China after Israel had worked very hard for well over a decade to uh, foster that relationship. I think that's an impressive list. I'm going to close, though, with the greatest surprise that I found in, and Walt and I found in, uh, in uh, looking at this uh, in an analytical way. Um, our chairman has already adverted to it. Of course, it's conventional wisdom that even if all this is true, the United States pays a substantial price in the Middle East for its relationship with Israel. And that's uh, so widely argued that people don't feel a need anymore uh, to defend the proposition with facts. So Walt and I looked at this and decided it isn't true. And uh, we went all the way back uh, to the creation of the State of Israel and went forward from there. And uh, since 1973, when the United States did pay such a price, of course, because of its massive airlift to Israel and the ensuing air oil boycott, we could not find a single instance in which the United States paid a price in the Arab world for its support for Israel. Not one. Now you might say, well then how can this be conventional wisdom? And the reason I believe it is, is that uh, generations of American diplomats in the Arab world heard their interlocutors, as they should have, who told them that America was going to pay a price for its relationship with Israel, and they dutifully reported this to Washington, which they should have. Um, and uh, what nobody seemed to notice over the years was it didn't happen. And the reason it didn't happen, in my judgment, is these uh, regimes, these Arab regimes, in the end, uh, were more preoccupied with their national interests and their relationship with the United States than they were with America's relationship with Israel. So we published that and then held our breath because you've been in this situation where you make an assertion and then you worry, what have I forgotten? And somebody will say, oh my goodness, how could you say there's been no penalty when it's obviously this? There was uh, considerable uh, uh, criticism of the report, I might say from the usual quarters, but none were able to uh, name an instance after the 73 war in which the United States paid a price uh, for its relationship with Israel. So that's what uh, we did, and I, uh, as I say, it's available if you want to have a look at it, uh, but I'm in no doubt now, having spent uh, uh, six months really studying this carefully uh, and I think objectively and analytically uh, that Israel is, has been for these decades a strategic asset for the United States. I believe, and I will presage our conversation in a moment, that uh, that will continue to be the case in the foreseeable future uh, in the context of the Arab revolt. But I'll stop there, David. Thank you, Bob. Now, Dennis, um, you were on the inside during many of these years, uh, as has been pointed out. And so I'd like to take the view from someone who was on the inside. Historically, did the people on the inside see Israel as a, an asset or a liability? And look at, you know, the different periods, you know, the period of the Cold War, the post-Cold War, and the post-9-11 world. Uh, has Israel been looked at at the same way by the United States from the inside. Dennis? Thank you, David. Uh, I've known Bob since 1981 when we met at the beginning of the Reagan administration. I was a child prodigy. <laughs> um, you know, I, I've, um, 
I've obviously I've come back to the Institute, which is a remarkably good place to be if one is serious about wanting to do real work. Uh, Henry Kissinger, who you carry his, his chair, Kissinger once said that when you serve in the government, you use up all your intellectual capital. Mm -hmm. When you're on the outside, you better build it up. And there's probably no better place to do it than here. Now, I am, I'm doing a new book. I know that comes as a major surprise. Mm -hmm. uh, and the book is on the U.S.-Israeli relationship. Uh, the title is actually Doomed to Succeed, the U.S.-Israeli relationship during a time of change in the Middle East. In the course of doing the research on this book, uh, it fits your question, David, because the first part of the book, the first couple of chapters are actually dealing with the, the history of the U.S. relationship with Israel from Truman through the Obama administration. And one of the really striking things is the issue that Bob last addressed, the issue of Israel's liability, was simply an article of faith. It wasn't simply a conventional wisdom, it was literally an article of faith. Uh, and ironically, if it was not for um, France and Germany, whether Israel could have made it through its first two, two decades is not clear because Germany was the key financial supporter uh, of Israel and France was the key military supporter of Israel and we were nowhere to be found, uh, at least in terms of what the government provided. Uh, the, the very first uh, arms sale is during the Kennedy administration. It causes a huge controversy within the administration, and it's over the sale of an anti-aircraft missile, a purely defensive missile, and the debate within the administration was focused on the disaster this would create for us with the Arabs. Uh, in, the, in the Nixon administration, which plays a pivotal role during the 73 war in terms of what is a massive airlift, uh, in March of 1970, uh, phantom sales, which phantoms were first sold during the Johnson administration, are suspended. And they're suspended in part because, again, there's a concern about Arab reaction. Uh, and we don't become the consistent suppliers of military assistance to Israel until after 1973. And the key turning point is the massive airlift supply. But even that isn't guaranteed. And I want to tell a story to start with uh, because uh, I was even younger in the Carter administration than I was when I met Bob, so I was really a prodigy at that point. Uh, but the very, first, the very first issue I had to deal with, I was in the Office of Program Analysis and Evaluation. This was the old Systems Analysis Office. And the very first issue I had to deal with, which was in the, um, the summer of 1977, I had just gotten there, uh, and it was an Israeli 10-year arms request, Matt Monsi. Matt Mont B is what was provided during the Nixon administration. It was a 10-year request, and I was asked uh, in an interagency meeting that was in the, uh, um, Bill, I see you, in the, in the tank, uh, in the JCS. The Joint Chief of Staff has, a, has something called the tank, and the whole interagency was represented. Uh, the different offices of the Pentagon were there, people from the NSC were there, the White House, the State Department, several different offices, the other offices, um, within the Pentagon, the intelligence community. So, there's, so every agency is represented, and the, and the question is, do the Israelis need this request? Uh, and everyone goes around the table, and they say, no, they don't need it. They can defeat any combination of the Arabs, period. They don't need it. Now, there's a presumption that, of course, is guiding us, who is, we don't want to do this because it's going to be costly to us. So, of course, the youngest person in the room then raises his hand, it happened to be me, and I said, well, I think you're focused on the wrong measure. I mean, there are at least several measures we ought to be thinking about when you evaluate the request. The first measure is, will this provision of arms enhance Israeli deterrence so there won't be a war in the first place? The second measure that we ought to be thinking about is, does this provision of arms put Israel in a position where if there is a war, there can be rapid war termination? Because we saw during the 73 war, and even at the end of 67, that there was tremendous potential for confrontation between the United States and the Soviet Union, and the last thing we need is an escalation here that produces not just a local war, but a confrontation between the two superpowers that, become, that could become nuclear. And the third is, because you seem particularly concerned about the relationship with the Arabs, shouldn't the Israelis have enough arms so we wouldn't have to immediately resupply them in the context of a war, the way um, we saw in 1973? 
So the image I want, how many people here saw the movie Annie Hall? <laughs> and do you remember the time when he's sitting with her family? Remember the image? Well, that's clearly every eye in the room was fixated on me, and that's who I was. The first response to me was, um, well, it's much more complicated than you think. And I said, well, actually, you're the ones who are saying it's simple. You say they can defeat any combination of the Arabs. I'm one who's actually identifying three different measures. Then, even more patronizingly, they, the people sort of collectively said, well, deterrence doesn't work with the Arabs. And I said, deterrence doesn't work with the Arabs? So you're telling me that an Arab leader, if he thinks that going to war is going to cost him his regime, uh, which it clearly did in the past, uh, you think that's not going to have an effect on them? And the answer was, it's just much more complicated than that. <laughs> now, later in the same administration, in the Carter administration, uh, I took part in what was the first uh, strategic dialogue with Israel. It was a discreet dialogue uh, run out of Andy Marshall's office, and I was the one who was in the Pentagon. And I was the one who was responsible for organizing it, shaping it, developing the agenda. Uh, and the one thing that was clear is it had to remain discreet. And the reason was because there was this tremendous fear that if the Arabs knew we were having a strategic dialogue with the Israelis, this would be a, you know, a catastrophe for us. And I remember asking the question, because we had to, this had to be, again, cleared in an agency. I said, so this is post-Camp David. Uh, and I said, so we're giving Israel now $3 billion a year. You really think the Arabs think we're so stupid that we wouldn't try to get something for it? And the answer was, it's much more complicated than that. <laughs> so you have to look at the backdrop uh, to the relationship and how things have evolved over time. It really is the Reagan administration that takes this discrete strategic dialogue which we began, which I have to say at a conceptual level was very good, uh, but it wasn't really translated into something that was political and visible until the Reagan administration. When the Reagan administration comes in and says, you know what, we're in the Cold War, we're in a competition with the Soviet Union, uh, and Israel is actually a tremendous asset to us. I mean, it's the equivalent of more than several aircraft carriers just in a very narrowly defined area, not to mention all the, the examples that, that Bob was giving. I mean, you go back to 1966 and what we're learning from the Israelis but it's almost like we have to be ashamed that we're learning these things from the Israelis. By the Reagan administration, it is transformed. And suddenly, we developed during the Reagan administration, this is actually something the two of us did a lot of work on, to actually develop the very concept of strategic cooperation. And strategic cooperation then becomes a hallmark from the Reagan administration on. In the Reagan administration, it is a function of the Cold War. The Bush administration carries it on, even though, as Susan said in her introduction, this was a, an administration that was characterized by ups and downs in the relationship. Nonetheless, there were some very fundamental things that were done with the Israelis, and, it, and the, the underpinnings, the strategic underpinnings, were maintained. And there was, a, there was an alphabet soup of different structures that we created to begin the strategic cooperation. So it wasn't just a rhetorical device, and it wasn't limited to what had begun in the Pentagon in a very limited way uh, in the Carter administration. It involved the Defense Department, the intelligence community, uh, the State Department, uh, and structures were set up over time and continued. During the Clinton administration, this is maintained. But the peace issue becomes an important part of the overall strategic framework of the relationship. If you look at the, the second Bush administration after 9-11, uh, it's the strategic cooperation is maintained, but it's built around a premise of counterterror. In the Obama administration, all of the structures are maintained, and as Bob was saying, they were actually, because over time, when you have structures that are um, sort of institutionalized, that's the good news and it's the bad news. Because while the good news means that this is something that's part of the strategic fabric and the institutional fabric, it also becomes fossilized. And everybody comes in, you'd have big delegations that would meet, and they were, they were set piece discussions that took place. That wasn't on all issues because, in fact, in the Bush administration, there was a, an important discrete structure that was related to, uh, to discussions on Iran. But the rest, of the, the rest of the structure became highly fossilized, and during the, during the Obama administration, an effort was made uh, to, to really breathe much more life into this and to make it much less set piece 
to intensify the nature of the discussions and to ensure that it was not a talking point exercise, but it was a kind of searching exercise. Now, the one thing that I would say is, if you've looked historically at this brief overview of what I've been describing, one of the things you see is that there was a Cold War basis against the Soviets, then there was a peace basis, and then there was a, a counter-terror basis. And I think in many ways, while the, the discussions today are focused on a wide array of different challenges, there is clearly a new reality in the Middle East. Uh, and what Bob was describing about the, the conventional wisdom, the article of faith that Israel's a liability, you know, some of the people who still want to believe in that will say, okay, well, maybe in the past those Arab leaders, even though, of course, they didn't admit at the time, those Arab leaders didn't speak for their publics. Now, look, there's going to be pressure from underneath, and so that's going to be costly to us. And you have to contend with that reality. My answer to that would be the following. We're in a period of enormous uncertainty. If there's one hallmark of this current period, it's uncertainty. And for all of those who uh, exhibit certainty about where things are going, I would simply say, bear in mind, you didn't predict this was going to happen. So when you tell me that you know exactly what's going to happen now, um, excuse me if I have just a little bit of skepticism about people who are so certain about what's going to happen. We don't know what's going to happen, but we do know one thing. We know that Israel is a democracy and is going to remain a democracy. We do know one thing. We know that the same groups that threaten Israel threaten us. And as long as we know that Israel is going to have a fundamental predictability and stability because it is a democracy, and as long as we know that the same forces that threaten Israel threaten us, then you know you have a fundamental strategic underpinning to maintain the relationship as it has been developed and as it should develop over time. That is not, by the way, an argument against further developing the conceptual underpinnings of what should guide this relationship. And how we deal with the Arab awakening needs to be an important part of this discussion, partly because Israel's stakes are enormous in this, and Israel has to think through from its own standpoint how to deal with it, and partly because the issues of peace, the issues of terror, uh, the meaning of the emergence of Islamists, all of these things are common concerns for the two of us and should shape the nature of this relationship as we go forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Now, now Amos, okay, you're looking at it from the other side of the pond. Uh, maybe you say, look, we're Israel, we exist, we can't think of ourselves just as an asset or a liability of the United States because we're dealing with all the threats. But to what extent is this sense of how you are seen in the U.S. shaping how Israel, in terms of its intelligence community, its national security apparatus, its military, to what extent is this idea of being an asset or liability to the United States having an impact in the way Israel makes its own decisions? I'm glad to be here with two ambassadors, two professors. Uh, professor Blackwell was my professor in Harvard. I didn't te learn from you in Georgetown, but I have learned a lot from you in the real world. And I'm only a farmer from a kibbutz and a fighter pilot, but I will try to add something to the discussion. Uh, I have to correct you, or not to correct you, you uh, absolutely justly uh, said that the Washington Institute is the best institute on the Middle East, I agree. But there is a competition from the other side of the ocean. So they have to be better to keep their first place. <laughs> uh, I don't want to go back to 1966. Even mix used to be my, uh, my area of interest. Uh, as we speak now, today, uh, the American defense and the American military forces are taking advantage of a very good advanced uh, Israeli systems. The UAV, which is part of the future of air power, was basically invented in Israel, testified in wars in Israel, and it is part of your air power and our air power, and we go forward together. Missile defense, 
a concept that basically uh, become operational on all range of missile defense, from small rockets to the arrow to your systems, which are against ballistic uh, intercontinental missile. Uh, it is going together. And what we are learning and what you are learning and the lessons are shared all the time. Cyber. Cyber is a new fascinating domain of warfare. Uh, young people, nobody who was born uh, before 1985 can really understand what's going on. <laughs> but it's a fascinating way of achieving strategic goals that Israel and the United States together developing and going forward. Counterterrorism, uh, urban area fighting, intelligence cooperation, it is going as we speak <clears throat> in many, many levels that the United States can enjoy the lessons and the doctrines and the way Israel dealing with the same problem that you are dealing uh, a couple of years ago in Iraq, today in Afghanistan, and who knows uh, when tomorrow. The marriage of an Israeli innovation, Israeli I, I, fresh ideas, the way Israelis can take forward a very complicated issue in a way that in America, with the huge bureaucracy, it takes some more time. At the end, a wonderful product. But this combination, I think, can bring to both countries a very important uh, and, <clears throat> and a very important weapon system on the tactical level, because almost every fighter pilot in the United States Air Force is flying with LBIT. A helmet gun sight. And almost every F-16 in the American fleet is equipped with Rafael Lightning, which is the best targeting port. But I'm not looking at a specific uh, system. I'm looking at the whole phenomena. But if we go from the tactical issue to the strategic issue, to the essence of the relations, I think Israel sees itself as the only democracy, stable democracy in the Middle East, sharing the same values with the United States. And this is not only the government of Israel. It's the people of Israel. If you ask them, you know, it's the only place in the Middle East that you are not see people putting an American flag into the fire in the street. On the contrary, together with the Israeli flag, on Independence Day, you, t you can see both of them, side by side. So the Israeli people feel that they have a lot in common with the values and the national interest and the strategic interest of the United States. And if I go back to my background as a pilot, Israel is a huge aircraft carrier with almost zero cost. And this is not one aircraft carrier. The United States, back in their mind, they know that if they need, if they need, in the last 30, 40 years since Kennedy uh, changed the strategic uh, relations, maybe since Reagan, I don't know where to start for. But in the last years that I'm in the business, Israel is ready to to have this aircraft carrier serving the American interest in the Middle East. There are many reasons why America don't want to use this uh, aircraft carrier, but it is there and they can trust that it will be there. It is not the Turkish issue that in 2003 suddenly they have decided not to let you go. It is not the Egyptian issue. It is not the Saudi issue. Of course, it is not the Iranian issues. Because there are five regional superpowers, Egypt, Saudi, Iran, Turkey, and Israel. Maybe Iraq will join if it will not disintegrate. And the only 
the only regional superpower that America can rely on, I will say forever, is, is, is Israel. We do have common interest, and sometimes, once again, not because America asks us to do it, because we have decided that we have to do it, it's coincident with the American interest. And it was uh, mentioned in the opening introduction, 1981, at the end of the day, was American interest to destroy the Iraqi nuclear reactor. You may think about the Gulf uh, War in 91, if Iraq was nuclear at that time. So the same people in the Pentagon, who, by the way, embargoed Israel after 1981, for, for a very short period. Unfortunately, it was my school that they kept in Texas for another six months. But in 1991, uh, I think uh, General Ivry got a very nice picture of this reactor, telling him, thank you for helping us in 1991, what you have done a decade ago. And according to the books that I read, the memories of Bush, Cheney, uh, Condoleezza Rice, in 2007, it was maybe the same issue that promoted the American interest of non-proliferation, of fighting the radical excess in the Middle East with zero cost to America. Zero cost to America. So, I think uh, I had another point, but it was covered very well by uh, Ambassador Blackwell, and this is the, the fact that Israel is not, the U.S. is not paying a lot in the Arab world on its relation with Israel. Maybe even getting some uh, bonuses out of it. And Israel, in a way, was the opening door to the United States to take away all the uh, Egyptians and other countries that were under uh, the influence of the Soviet Union. And I agree absolutely that the cost for America to have good relations with Israel are not I, if at all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Amos. Okay, let's get current here and talk about something that's on a lot of your minds, which is the whole crisis with Iran, the nuclear challenge, and how is the U.S.-Israel relationship weathering that crisis as you see it? Maybe, Bob, we'll start with you. Is it helpful when Israel, you know, you have, you've had statements by Ehud Barak, uh, late could be too late, later could be too late. You had a visit of Prime Minister Netanyahu here in March, uh, also making similar sorts of statements. Uh, is that helpful to the U.S., a, a kind of a, almost a good cop, bad cop situation as the United States heads into diplomacy, strengthening America's hand as it deals with Iran and Istanbul and Baghdad and uh, beyond? Or, or is it unhelpful? Does it suggest uh, that, uh, you know, when Israel doesn't exactly synchronize uh, its position with the U.S. that causes America some headaches. How would you say, Bob, that the U.S. and Israel are weathering this Iranian nuclear challenge uh, in recent months? Well, of course, Dennis, I'm, I'm going to be brief because I think Dennis can be analytically authoritative about this, but I'll, I'll give you just a couple of uh, points. First of all, I think that the Israeli uh, emphasis on the possibility of using military force to deal with the Iranian nuclear pro uh, problem was a, a, a major reason we were able to get much more, much stronger sanctions from the Europeans than we would have gotten otherwise. So I make that point. Uh, the second is, uh, with respect to Iranian behavior, I do wish that there was somewhat more coherence coming out of Israel on the use of military force, uh, but uh, no American uh, can, with a straight face, complain about another democracy's many voices in expressing policy. So uh, that's part of the democratic system. I want to make uh, one last point, 
and it's one that worries me a lot, and uh, which I haven't seen expressed elsewhere, but usually when you haven't seen it expressed elsewhere, it just means you haven't read enough. But I want to make this point to you, because I think it's important. I think that uh, the U.S.-Israel relationship with respect to Iran has one very dangerous element to it, and one that could produce uh, the biggest crisis in the U.S.-Israel relationship since Suez. And that is uh, uh, the possibility that an Israeli attack on Iran would lead the Iranians to escalate in a way that brought America into the war, brought America into the war. And if that war turned out to be a long war, the effect on the United States and the U.S.-Israel relationship. Uh, the Persians uh, fight long wars. I commend Herodotus to you. And I don't know how the U.S. society would stand up to a war and the U.S.-Israel relationship would stand up to a war that began because of an Israeli attack, especially if such a war brought uh, violence to the Ameri terrorism to the American homeland, especially if such a war uh, produced a uh, substantial economic downturn in the United States, especially if such a war uh, raised gasoline prices to five plus dollars and so forth. In that event, I'm not sure how American society would react to Israel and the U.S.-Israel relationship if it had to pay a very high, uh, a very substantial cost for it. And this leads me to uh, the prescription that, uh, and this is not a time to repeat our discussion earlier in the conference on Iran, but uh, because of this particular factor, I think that uh, both the United States and Israel have to think very carefully about how to shape if they do uh, if, if, if a war, in fact, does occur with Iran, how to shape the attack in a way that reduces the likelihood of Iranian escalation. And I'll conclude by just saying we heard one speaker here recommend an uh, all-out, many-week, thousands of sorties attack on Iran uh, with the uh, purpose of a regime change. Well, uh, he didn't have time to mention what the Iranians would do in such a circumstance, including in the United States with Hezbollah oper operatives in Mexico and so forth. So I think shaping the, uh, or attempting to shape the Iranian reaction to any military attack uh, would be a crucial factor. But that's what keeps me up late at night worrying about the U.S.-Israel relationship. For the rest of it, I agree entirely with Dennis that the Arab revolt has produced such uncertainty and already the emergence of un unsavory elements in these countries that Israel's democracy and, as almost said, uh, long-time uh, intimate relationship with the United States is more of an asset than ever in this uh, very, very uncertain Middle East. Thank you, Bob. Dennis? I want to pick up on uh, some of the themes that, that Bob raised. Let me start by uh, recounting a conversation I had at our dinner table last night when um, we got into a discussion and I said, it is true that Israel is talking a lot uh, about Iran. And I said, now let's compare this to the past. With Osirak, meaning in 1981, did the Israelis talk about it publicly? The answer is no. Uh, before Al-Kabar, what was done against the Syrian nuclear reactor in 2007, did the Israelis talk about it publicly? The answer is no. So I asked the question, obviously a rhetorical question since I was going to give the answer, <laughs> uh, why is it that the Israelis are talking the way they're talking now? And I said there are really two reasons. The first reason is to create motivation in the rest of the world. 
you don't want us to use force, then you better put the kind of pressure on the Iranians that obviates the need for the use of force. And Bob made the point about the sanctions. Uh, I think it's pretty clear to say the EU has adopted a sanction where they're going to boycott the purchase of Iranian oil. And I doubt many people, even a year ago, would have predicted that the EU would have been prepared to take that kind of a step. But they don't want to see the use of force, and the Israelis have created uh, a very strong impression that there will be the use of force for reasons that are related to what is in fact an existential threat to Israel. Uh, but I wouldn't only limit it to the Europeans. The Chinese, uh, who supported the Security Council Resolution 1929, uh, did so because there was an awful lot of work done with the, with the Chinese by us, uh, but I would also say by the Israelis. I actually, I was in Beijing uh, shortly after an Israeli delegation had been there. Uh, and the fact that they had left an impression of the choices Israel faced was something that helped to, I think, underpin the kind of strategic discussions that I was having with the Chinese on this issue. And I think the point here is that there are probably two reasons that the Israelis are so public about this. One is to create motivation. And the other is to condition the world that in the event that diplomacy fails, no one's going to be surprised that Israel has acted. And that really leads me to the, uh, to the second point, which, is, which Bob was raising. I think the key here, again, brings you back to what is probably my favorite word, which is context. Um, my mother gave me the middle initial B. For some reason, she never gave me a middle name. I don't know why my parents thought that a middle initial was sufficient, but... Uh, in any case, it was B, and it really should have been C because I usually talk about context everywhere I go, and I would say context is he key here. You know, the, one of the ways to deal with the concern that Bob raised, but it's not only limited to the issue of the U.S. and Israel, but it's, it's in fact a function of the use of force more generally, and it applies to us as well. One has to create a context for the use of force. Uh, the fact is that you have to demonstrate unmistakably that, in fact, everything that was done that could have been done to try to resolve the difference through diplomatic means. It means you don't use force before that context has been created, in no small part because, as we were saying yesterday, there isn't a military solution to this problem. There is a military means that can be employed to set it back, but then it has to be followed by diplomacy. Just as the the threat of the use of force has underpins your diplomacy now. If the Iranians really believe they're not just paying an economic price, but they could also face the use of force, they're more likely to respond to the diplomacy. If the diplomacy fails, then in fact, the force is used, you still have to use diplomacy after the fact. If the perception internationally is that there was a deal that was available for Iran, that they could have civil nuclear power and a proposal was put on the table, they turned it down and that was publicized and everyone saw that. And then it became clear that the Iranians had a way out but it was, it was very clear that they chose not to take it because they really want nuclear weapons. Then the use of force in that context becomes something that is much more easily understood, including here. And I think the, the, um, the question becomes, not only do you prepare the context, but you also prepare the ground even now. And I don't just mean what I was just describing, I also mean we need to be talking with our allies and with the Israelis. We have a very profound ongoing discussion with the Israelis on every aspect of the Iranian issue. Every aspect of the Iranian issue. We need also though to be having a conversation with the Europeans and the Russians and the Chinese about the thresholds that are acceptable for diplomatic outcomes, and the consequences if diplomacy is not going to succeed. It shouldn't just be that the Israelis are talking a lot, which because they're talking a lot, they've also triggered a reaction, which is what you're referring to the debate within Israel. It shouldn't only be that's the thing that's out there publicly. It also should be our private conversations with the Europeans to again prepare the basis of diplomacy, what we're seeking in terms of objectives, but what are the consequences if diplomacy doesn't succeed? How much time are we going to give to this? You know, what are the measures that, in fact, what the Iranians are prepared to do at the table indicates that this is for real? Uh, what are the measures that we would use to determine that this is not the case, so that you don't just have an open-ended process and it takes on a life of its own, notwithstanding what Iran's behavior is on the nuclear question? The more you do on that now, 
the more you set the ground with Europeans, which will eventually also, I think, set an environment publicly in Europe and here if force has to be used. At the end of the day, using force is a means, not an answer, and therefore you have to have a diplomatic answer after the fact if you're actually going to deal with this threat. You know, the, what we heard yesterday um, from one of the participants was an open-ended approach, by the way, which couldn't guarantee success, even then. Uh, and if you're, if you're serious about trying to deal with this problem, then you better think about every aspect of it. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, I must maybe pick up on that point, or at least on half of it, uh, because you hear that people say in the U.S.-Israeli dialogue, well, Israel finds it very useful tactically to raise the volume because it, it, is, it has definitely moved sanctions forward. It has definitely created a sense of, of, of an, a different environment that, that a strike is possible and, and could motivate Iran to cut a deal and to back off. But if you had to actually implement the threat, it, doesn't, it isn't as useful as the threat itself because Israel doesn't have America's capabilities. And to pick up on what Dennis said, it, doesn't, uh, it won't be able to galvanize a post-strike multilateral coalition to ensure that they cannot import materiel so they cannot reconstitute their program. So it's a great threat by Israel that it has been able to raise the volume but the implementation of the threat will not be as great. As someone who led the, the strike on the first nuclear reactor, I think you're uniquely positioned, and as someone who's head of military intelligence, talk to us about the difference between the threat and its implementation. I don't want to take credit that I don't deserve. I didn't lead the... You were the, you were the first guy. I, I was one of the pilots. Uh, <laughs> I think we have to go back to the strategic level. Both sides are sharing the same strategic goal. And this is to prevent Iran from being nuclear, because Iran with nuclear weapons is, even if they are, they are rational, they are very dangerous, it will change the balance of power in the Middle East. Iran will be the hegemon. The United States don't want it to happen. Israel don't want it to happen, and this regime with a nuclear bomb is a very strategic threat to both countries. So we share the same goal. Where problem starts? When you have, by the way, we even share the same intelligence to the very high level. The same facts are in front of the uh, policy analysis, policy uh, the people who are doing the recommendations, and of course, the political masters. The problem start is with the interpretation, with the analysis about the same database, the same fact, the same information, the same intelligence, how you, you move from here to the strategic goal, which is also in common. So the roof is the same roof, the uh, foundations are the same foundation, but in the house, there are a couple of arguments. And there is an argument about what is the Iranian intention. And from time to time, you hear that they haven't decided yet. I covered it yesterday. I'm not going back to it today. There is a huge argument about what is the right strategy, whether you can engage with Iran, and reach an agreement that, by the way, I think it's the best solution. It's the best solution, but there is an argument whether it can be achieved. And on what parameters? And here I want you to look very good into the parameters of, of a potential deal with Iran. It is not going to be done in Baghdad. I think the Iranians will take us to some other capitals during the years, this year, maybe next year. But maybe one day there will be a, an agreement. And don't pay attention to the 20%. Don't pay attention to all the words. Look what is happening to the watch. Look how far the Iranians are now from nuclear bomb if they decide to break out. And to take the watch backward, 
what you need is to take the low, the low in which you earn you, not the 20%. The, the five, six, seven tons that they already accumulated, that they can create four or five nuclear bombs. This should be shipped out of Iran. Fardo, the, the, the site near Qom should be closed. Then we are going out of the zone of immunity. And inspection should be much more serious, like the additional protocol. This is the three important uh, ingredients in a good deal. There are many bad deals around, and we have to be on the same page that a bad deal will not be achieved. There will be a discussion whether the sanctions are working. By the way, if the Iranians will agree to acceptable deal, this is the proof that the sanctions are working. And there is uh, other, if agreement fail, uh, other more proactive uh, strategies that both countries are, uh, are considering. And the importance, I think a very important speech was given by the President of the United States. Basically reaffirm in a very clear words that is in the business of prevention and not accepting a nuclear Iran, and not because it's an Israeli national security interest, because it's an American national security interest. And when you listen to President Obama speaking about American national security interest, it's important because Obama is not automatically against any use of force, but he thinks that use of force should be done for a very important American national security interest. So we are on the same page on it. But once again, what kind of strategy to adapt, whether it a little bit more, by the way, you go with C for context. I go with C for covert, clandestine, cyber. <laughs> but you, you, you don't think that's context? I, I can take context as well. But the context is that, unfortunately, I'm not sure this is working. So you have to go one, one step forward and to, to really look whether a military attack is the only, the only uh, option left. I'm not sure this is the situation now. This is exactly what discussed between the two countries. But by definition, there will be a difference in the timeline between the Israelis and the Americans, due to a physical issue and due to a conceptual issue. The physical issue is we have an excellent Air Force, but you have a larger Air Force with much more capabilities. B-2, uh, F-22, bunker bastards, air refueling capability. So when Israel feels that this is the last time it can do something about it, the American Air Force can do it later on, a year, two years. I'm not going into the, the details. But more important than that, the American timeline is dictated by the red line, a different trend line, a different trigger. The Israeli trigger, according to uh, what the Prime Minister, Defense Minister are saying, is not to allow Iran the possibility to break out. The possibility to break out. So whenever they are going to enter the zone of immunity that they can possibly break out every day, this is the time to act. If you listen very carefully to the Americans, they say, we don't so much care that they have the possibility. If they really actually break out, then we will act then we will prevent them. And uh, you should ask yourself, will they really have the intelligence to know about it? Because as we go forward, the breakout time becomes shorter and shorter. And then do you have a plan that you can in such a short time execute, especially if you don't undermine the Iranians' sophistication to break out in a time that America is busy in some other part of the world or with another internal uh, crisis. So 
these issues are important. These issues should be discussed, and I hope they are discussed. I have not been there in the rooms in the last year and a half, but these issues can, if the two sides that have the same strategic goal trust each other, that if one side is losing some option, the other side will compensate for it if it's needed, I think we are on a, on a, on a good page. If they don't trust each other, then it is much more problematic. Thank you. All right. We, we, okay, one second. Just wait one second. We'll, give, uh, we'll do one more round, uh, and then we'll go to the audience. But thank you, Amos C. Yadlin. I always thought cyber, covert, clandestine was not what you see, it's what you don't see. But anyway, we'll leave that, uh, we'll leave that aside. Let me just do one quick round and get to the audience. We'll do this, I don't know, call it a lightning round, but uh, we'll go to the audience. Um, because we want to hear from you. But, uh, you know, we, the session was also talking about what the impact of the Arab Spring awakening is on U.S. Israel relations. And I think that would it be fair uh, to each of you, and uh, maybe, Dennis, we can start with you on this, um, to look at how the two sides see the issue of, of peace in this period. In other words, you see sometimes from the Israeli side, people say, well, if there's a hurricane, like there is in the Middle East right now, you've got to hunker down in the basement. And sometimes you think the American side is to say, hey, you know, this, is, um, this, this hurricane could last for decades, and you can go to the basement for a short time, but you can't live in the basement. And are you going to buy, is the impasse, which obviously is not all on Israel, but is it going to strengthen those elements in the Arab upheaval in Egypt and Syria that thrive off the impasse, that build themselves domestically in the impasse? If we've taken Turkey, President Erdogan, does he exploit the impasse of his Islamist party for domestic political gains? So in this new era of Arab democratic politics, how does U.S.-Israeli assessments on peace, how do they... How do the, to what extent are they in sync or not in sync over this issue of hunkering down? So, Dennis, maybe we'll start with you, and then Bob and you pick up, and Amos will go to the, to the audience. Uh, I, I, I'll address that, but I also, I suspect Bob will pick up something as well. Uh, I also want to address something that, that Amos said at the end. Um, I think one thing is, uh, is very clear. <clears throat> the administration right now is very acutely sensitive to the Israeli calculus. It knows it probably better than at any time. Uh, in all the years I've been part of the U.S.-Israeli relationship, I don't know that there's ever been as much clarity on an issue as there is between the two sides on this. It doesn't mean, because there is, a, there is an objective reality that you described, that from an Israeli standpoint, they lose the military option to act at a point that is very different than the point at which we lose it. I'm not so convinced, by the way, that there, there is as much as a gap as you think on the issue of breakout and definition of breakout and what creates responses. But I think that on this one particular issue of, that you ended with on the sensitivity to the Israeli needs uh, and what could affect uh, Israel acting, there really is a profound set of discussions. I would just call your attention to the fact that the, the week before the Prime Minister came to see the President, the National Security Advisor went to Israel, went only to Israel, uh, ended up having broad discussions, but five hours with the Prime Minister. Uh, and I don't recall a time historically where we've ever, ever had an American National Security Advisor go and spend five hours with the Prime Minister focused only on security issues. So, and I think it's fair to say that you can assume that, that this was the, the major point of discussion between them. So that's, uh, I, let me just, I'm just responding to that, David. Now, in terms of, <clears throat> of the other question, look, I think there is, um, there is an American view that, and I don't think it's unique to this administration, it certainly has been, I think, a part of every administration I've been a part of, that if there's a way to overcome the, the, the difficulties to producing peace, uh, 
it makes sense to try to find that way. Now, I also think that there is no naivete that suddenly you wave a magic wand and all the differences disappear. So you have to bring to the you have to bring an understanding to the to the context that exists. You know, peacemaking depends upon a set of circumstances. Uh, one of the things that we're facing right now is the rising tide of the Muslim Brotherhood has a chilling effect. It has a chilling effect on Abu Mazen, because were he to make big concessions, he envisions a big backlash. It has a chilling effect on the Prime Minister of Israel, because he's thinking, you know, who am I dealing with and what's the future? Now there's a paradox here, because if there's one thing that's going on right now uh, throughout the Arab Middle East, it's an internal preoccupation. And that internal preoccupation, in a strange way, does create a certain freedom for Israelis and Palestinians when everybody else is focused on themselves. It does create a certain freedom to do something. But on the other hand, there's a context that's difficult. One, what I just described, which is it creates a chilling effect. And two, the general disbelief on the part of both publics. You know, a little less than a month ago, there was a poll in Israel that showed 78% of the Israeli public would accept the Clinton parameters to resolve the conflict. For all the talk about all the change and how Israel's moved to the right, 78% would accept the Clinton parameters, which tells me if there's a belief that you actually could produce an outcome, you'd have very wide support for it. The problem is pretty close to the same 78% that believes they could accept that also believes it's never going to happen. And there's a mirror image on the Palestinian side. There have been polls on the Palestinian side that aren't 78%, but they're between 60 and 70% on terms, maybe not labeled the Clinton parameters, but not very, pretty close to the Clinton parameters, that say they would accept that as an outcome. And the same 60 to 70% say it'll never happen. And that's the context in which both leaders operate. So there's the rising tide of the Muslim Brotherhood. There's a disbelief on the inside. Uh, and in that context, to think that, well, you're just going to go and peace is going to emerge is an illusion. So the question is, and this is the essence of statecraft, how do you change the context so you can get to the point where you could make peace? The impulse in every American administration I've ever been a part of was to think about, all right, what can you do to do that? And in different Israeli administrations, it's not always the same. By the way, in some, it has been. In some cases, they've been the lead. In other cases, it hasn't been. And the, the challenge for us is, particularly now, one thing I would say is the, it's always safe to hunker down. But the problem with hunkering down is that inevitably your strategic choices shrink. And if there's one thing that I can say as an old policy planner, what you're trying to do is expand the field of choice, not see the field of choice contract. And so this is one of the things that, you know, we need, this should be part of the strategic dialogue that we have with the Israelis. Uh, and, you know, I think that that is something that is important. It's part of the way I would, there needs to be an ongoing strategic dialogue on the question of uh, what's happening with the Arab awakening. And it needs to be, part of that discussion needs to be what's the relationship of the peace issue to this. One driving factor uh, in the upheaval, and that, you know, I actually, use the term upheaval because that's really more the case that describes the reality we're seeing. One driving factor is this profound sense of injustice. Now it's an internal injustice, but if there's a cause that's out there that is seen as identified with injustice and it doesn't go away, sooner or later it will visit itself uh, on, in the rest of the region and you have to think ahead. You can't only take a snapshot of where you are and think things will remain as they are unchanged. Thank you, Dennis. Bob? Thank, thank you, David. Um, almost said something so important uh, that I want to uh, underline it. And it has to do with the substance of a negotiated settlement. Uh, and I think any administration, American administration, uh, would at least be tempted to accept a less than perfect agreement if the alternative is war. But we shouldn't fool ourselves, in my judgment, about the nature of such an agreement. And the metric for all of us to use in coming to our own views of whether the agreement, if one emerges, is in American national interest is, as Amos said,
Gush it push out the timeline for Iranian breakout? That's the question. And many of the formulas that are being uh, publicly discussed now, including allowing Iran to uh, enrich three and to three to five percent uh, uranium, do not push out the timeline for uh, Iranian breakout. In fact, if the Iranians are able to increase the volume of their uh, stockpile and uh, are able to uh, modernize their centrifuges, if they do decide to break out, they will be able to produce many more nuclear weapons in a much shorter time frame. So I wanted to stress that. If I can give a plug to the Council on Foreign Relations, I've edited a book on the Iranian nuclear issue, uh, which will be published in mid-June, uh, which looks at all of the dimensions of the Iranian nuclear issue, sanctions, U.S. attack on Iran, Israeli attack on Iran, and so forth, regime change. Uh, but it has no prescriptions in it. Uh, it seeks to be entirely analytical and do the pros and cons of each of those. And it'll be on sale at Am uh, from Amazon for about two bucks, if uh, you'd like. Finally, to the broader issue, I will put it just very quickly like this. I've believed uh, since the Arab Revolt uh, began that at least for the next three years, this was bad for the United States and bad for Israel, and maybe for longer than that. Uh, and the reason is that forces have been unleashed, symbolized by the Muslim Brotherhood, but others too, in these countries which are antithetical to American national security interests. So this is, uh, a, it's not only uncertain, but it's an increasingly hostile environment in which American diplomacy uh, has to uh, try, as uh, Dennis said, to kind of change the context but so that's my first headline, bad for the United States, these events, uh, at least in the shorter term of next three to five years. Maybe eventually we will have uh, uh, Athenian democracies in these countries, but no time soon. But the second is the United States, the most powerful country uh, uh, in, uh, in the world, has a margin for error to be banal that Israel does not have. And so uh, with respect to Israel's perspective, you can think of me as Mr. Hunker Down. Uh, I think that if I were uh, Israeli leaders, I would be extremely cautious now because of the degree of uncertainty in the Middle East and because their margin of error uh, in, uh, if they make a mistake is so delicate. Amos? Yeah, I think uh, to your uh, direct question, I don't see, uh, let's put it in a positive way. Uh, it is orthodox, orthogonical issues. Uh, there is no much connection between, I don't call it Arab Spring, I don't call it Arab Awakening, I call it Arab Intifada. <clears throat> and the Israeli Palestinian. Uh, crisis or a conflict should be solved anyway. And both of them, there is not so much that if Israel will go out and give more concessions to the Palestinians, suddenly the Arab intifada will go to the right way. Assad will say, okay, because Israel was so generous to the Palestinians, I also will uh, give the, uh, the, demonstrate, the, the people who demonstrate democracy in, uh, in Syria or the Islamists in, uh, in Egypt, okay, because Israel was so nice to Hamas, we will give the people of Tahrir, the secular, uh, liberal, young people, to be the rulers of Egypt. There is not a real connection there. There is not a real connection. However, we don't, it will be a mistake to say because of the Arab Spring, we are freezing something, by the way, that was frozen before the Arab Spring. It's in the parking lot for the last two years anyway. Anyway, we have to take it from the parking lot, not because of the Arab Spring, 
because it's in an Israeli interest. It's in an Israeli interest to go forward with the Palestinians. And unlike what many people in the United States, especially in Washington DC, think the excess of the world is not the Israeli-Palestinian issue. And we, can, we should solve it to, because of the, the, the sake of Israel, and not because of it will change everything, not to America in the Middle East, not to the Middle East itself. Unfortunately, the, the Arab Intifada, the Arab Spring, made it even harder to solve. Because what do you need to solve the Israeli-Palestinian issue? You need an Israeli leadership that will be willing to do the very tough historical concessions to the Palestinians. You need a Palestinian leadership that will be willing to do the very tough, painful concessions to the Israelis. You need the Arab countries and our, around us to support this Palestinian leadership to do the concessions and not to push them not to do. You need the international community to put some value on the negotiation table that according to what I've learned in, in Harvard in negotiation, there will be additional value on the table for both sides, that it will not be a zero-sum game. And you need the bad guys to be weak and not to spoil the process. Because as long as Iran is there as a strong, uh, a strong su uh, regional superpower with a lot of influence, there will be not Israeli-Palestinian peace. So all these five ingredients, due to what happened in the Arab Spring in the last year, are making the peace process even more difficult. It wasn't easy before. The Israeli leadership is saying it's a hurricane. We gave land for peace. Now they are taking the peace away. So why do it again? The Palestinians don't want to, to do anything because they're afraid of their own street that will basically do what was done to Gaddafi or to other leaders. The Arabs are busy with themselves. Are they going to support peace process with Israel? It's against the Arab street. America and Europe has no value to put on the, on the table. Look at the economies in both sides. And only, only the bad guys, I think, are weaker than they have been a year ago, but not weak enough not to uh, spoil the process. So it's a huge, uh, it's a huge challenge anyway. Uh, by the way, in our institute, we are doing now a policy research how to take the peace process out of the freezer or the parking lot with new paradigms that not necessarily based on uh, the Palestinians' agreement, because we can wait forever. Because it's an Israeli interest to, if you cannot solve it uh, in a way we solve the, uh, the issues with other countries, with basically to, to reach the final agreement, at least go forward to make this situation more sustainable, more uh, defense uh, for Israel, more on the moral side. And we can do it on our own, as we have made many things before when we have nobody to negotiate it with. Thank you. Thank you, Amos. Okay, why don't we go to your questions and raise your hand. And if I could see you back there, Moses Slavitsky. Hello. Thank you very much, uh, everybody. Uh, I'm Moses Levitsky. I'm a trustee from the West Coast, by the way, from the San Francisco area. And I had the great pleasure, with many others over here, to go on a trip into the region about a year and a half ago. We visited Egypt, Jordan, the Palestinian territories, and Israel. And I don't know about, I mean, David, you were on the trip. Uh, I don't know about you, and I don't know about the others, but I certainly had the impression you know, at the time, there was some daylight between the U.S. and Israel on a number of issues. And I certainly got the impression uh, in a number of places that it actually made 
uh, the Arabs uncomfortable, <laughs> that they didn't quite know what to do with it, that uh, they said that uh, uh, they really didn't understand where American policy was going, and that somehow the uh, uh, a little more certainty in how we, we treat our allies and how, we, how, how the U.S. deals with Israel uh, would, make, would give them some more direction in some of the things they were looking to do. So I just was wondering if you would comment on that. Maybe due to the shortage of time, we'll take a couple together. So uh, Marvin Kalb. This is mostly for Amos, but I'd appreciate the comments of the other panelists as well. Amos, you said before that trust between the two sides is so essential a factor, and Dennis was talking about the degree of cooperation between Israel and the U.S. at a very high point now in terms of intelligence and military cooperation. What will President Obama have to do to recapture, to regenerate a degree of Israeli trust, especially from the Prime Minister, that could lead to a deal. Or I think that's Edward Ludwig. In regard to the institutional review of U.S.-Israeli relations going back decades, there is one exception, not ter terrifically important, but it is an exception, and that is the CIA. In my experience, uh, limited experience perhaps, uh, uh, the CIA is, is the sleepy hollow of sort of 1950s Arab thing, and the, if there was the CIA Middle East people were here, they would have booed uh, Ambassador Blackwell and so on. Uh, the second uh, thing about the strike plan, of course, uh, again, Ambassador Blackwell's comments are very well taken, but the fact is that if you go to the U.S. Air Force, the U.S. Air Command, I should say, and ask them to do such an operation, they only have one mode which is indeed very large scale. They don't have the small scale mode. They don't offer it to you. So in reality, there are two possible strike plans. One is an Israeli one, which is necessarily small, and one, an American one, which bureaucratically must be very large. They just won't do it off the aircraft carrier with 12 aircraft. And therefore, the odd result is that the Israeli mode of attack would have results very similar to those of an imperfect negotiation because the Israelis can certainly do it without evoking huge reactions and so on, but the results would also be you know, pretty limited in terms of delaying the breakout. So that's the you know, strange uh, outcome. Uh, the, the final thing is that for all these decades that uh, people on this platform have been protagonists and not merely observers, there was always a one-sided aspect to this Israeli-American relationship. Today, that is no longer so because there's a rising cost every day, which is not a huge cost, but it is rising, for the Israelis not being able to cooperate with China. And those of us who go to China all the time hear this all the time. Amos, why don't we start with you this time. Uh, Marvin's question about how to rebuild, uh, in his view, how to bolster uh, U.S.-Israeli trust. If I understood Edward Litwack's question is a very interesting uh, asymmetry. People talk usually about the asymmetry of capabilities between the U.S. and Israel. But what, what's also interesting is that Israel's signature strike is probably going to be more surgical. And because the U.S. mode tends to be we don't want to lose a single pilot, a single ship, we take more precautions, but we also do much more damage. What Israel might do in a couple hours, the U.S. might do in a couple of weeks. So the, the, the counterintuitive view is that Israel's um, strike would actually maybe, would, would maybe cause less damage and therefore maybe, maybe less destabilizing because it would lead to less Iranian deaths. Uh, the opposite view tends to be whatever the U.S. does has more legitimacy in keeping together a multilateral coalition against the reconstitution of an Iranian program. So... Can you look at this asymmetry in terms of different styles of strikes and, and what that means? Um, why don't we start with that and then we'll go to Dennis and, and, and to Bob. I think the trust uh, in Israel uh, 
American president has to do with what he is basically doing, what he is saying, and some instinct uh, where his heart is. Okay? Uh, I think with President Obama, what he has done to the security of Israel is one of the uh, best done by any American president. And in this time, we have more exercise, we have more strategic dialogues, we have more uh, uh, military uh, dialogues, we have many, many visits of officials uh, back and forth, and it seems, and in this time of, of a financial crisis and budget problems, the Israeli uh, defense assistant was not touched. So the Israelis feel, and I think the president uh, got the trust in his care for Israeli defense and for Israeli basic uh, uh, needs for security. Uh, on speaking, I think they were very suspicious on the Cairo speech, very suspicious. They were insulted that he was in the neighborhood, and didn't pay a visit, and they felt that in a way he want to open the door to the Islamic world on with some Israeli uh, tokens. Um, when I uh, speak about it in Israel, I say, you know, President Bush never visited Israel in the first term, and his first and second visits were in the last year of the second term. So maybe Obama can be even better than Bush if he will visit soon. But the real issue, I think, is Israelis are suspicious about where he is standing on the issue who is right and who is wrong, or whose narrative to adapt, the Israeli narrative or the Palestinian narrative. On this, they are very suspicious. Since uh, uh, the president basically uh, show uh, a very decisive uh, move in favor of Israel in the UN lately, there is food for thoughts for us on this as well, as well. Um, on the second issue of attacking Iran, I will not go to any specific on, on the operational plan, not of the Israeli, not of the American, but I think there are two big mistakes here in thinking. One, that you look only on the military attack itself, what it will achieve. And we spoke about it yesterday. This is a technical engineering measure that in the strategic world is not, not that important. What really important is the week and the months after, what will be the Iranian reaction, and you know I belong to those who are not accepting my colleagues uh, in the Pentagon that think that this will be doomsday. I think it will be very calculated uh, limited reaction, not necessarily targeting the United States. It's against the Iranian very cautious and sophisticated strategy. If you have a fight with a small boy here and the real Biryon, bully, bully of, the, of the neighborhood is there, you are not going and punch him in the, in the face. And remember all the threats of Saddam Hussein in 91, 2003, nothing happened especially if you will do it according to a very good article that I think you have published in the Wall Street Journal, surgically. Leave the Iranians, all their assets on the table, ready to be attacked if they will retaliate in the way that I think they will know. But I'm not always knowing the, the, the future. So, this is one mistake. You have to look not only on the attack, but on the day after, and don't uh, paint it in black to justify what you are not doing. 
and then look to the year and decade after, which is so important, and we spoke about it. What you are doing after that the Iranians for the first time understood that they can be attacked. It's already happened. So they will change, they will recalculate their strategy and sanctions and a reliable threat for another visit. Because whoever destroyed the Iraqi nuclear reactor or the Syrian nuclear reactor, we already exceeded the four or five years of the engineering rebuilding of a new nuclear problem, program. But the whole strategic environment called for them not to go forward to another program. This is very, very important. Dennis, can you pick up on something that Amos said uh, which at, at the start? Because he says, you know, the U.S.-Israel uh, military security relationship has never been better. He said that, and at the same time, he tried to deal with Marvin's question about, you know, some of the rockiness in the political relationship. Now, to some Americans, that sounds like dissonance. They will say, how could it be that security ties have never been better? Shouldn't that have somehow smoothed over any differences between the leaders over these last four years? As someone who was in the White House for some of that time, what's your perspective on, on these two different facets of the bilateral relationship. Well, I also want to deal with what Amos addressed. So I'll, uh, let me start with your question, and I'll come back to what Amos addressed. Um, you used a word that I think is the right word. You used perspective. It's a synonym of context. No, it's a... Uh... <laughs> Call me David P. Makovsky. <laughs> Look, it's maybe because I have worked closely with every Israeli prime minister since Shamir. Uh, you know, I have a perspective on every relationship that every American president has had with his counterpart since that time. And I know there's a tendency to always take the snapshot and to be preoccupied with the snapshot. I'm not that way. Now, maybe it's a failing on my part, but I'm not that way. And I try to look at how things have evolved over time, number one. Number two, I look at the fundamentals. What is the one thing that for Israel is the point of departure? Security. If you're not dealing with security, then you're not dealing with the fundamentals. And from my standpoint, when you deal with the fundamentals, that shapes uh, a lot of what happens. I've been in different administrations where I've seen ups and downs, you know, what a surprise. We don't agree with the Israelis on everything. Is there any country with whom we agree on everything? The answer is no. I mean, I even I've, don't agree with ourselves. Well, well that, that's a unique Israeli perspective. <laughs> but so I, you know, I'm, I, I don't see this sense of, gee, there's this fundamental gap in trust. For me, I'm, I measure it in terms of behaviors, number one. And on the Israeli side, you know, I said to some of you before, but others will hear it now, you know, there have been two times when the Prime Minister of Israel felt in great need. And who was the first person he called? He called the President of the United States in this administration, both at the time of the Turkish flotilla and at the time of the, you know, fear of a lynching in the Cairo embassy. He didn't call others. He called the President of the United States. And the President of the United States in each case delivered. Uh, you, you look at the character of the conversations uh, on Iran and everything else that, uh, that Amos was referring to in terms of security, and I think there is a context here where the, the relationship in my mind uh, is one that I think reflects, in truth, a trust. Because, you, you know, if, if someone you're not going to count on, you're not going to call them when the chips are down. So I, I look at the fundamentals, and then when you have these kinds of occurrences, and I look at it against the backdrop of a lot of different experiences over time. Almost, by the way, you know, it's interesting, this, the, the focus on visits. The only president who went to Israel during his first term was Clinton. And that was because of the assassination of the prime minister, uh, which was his first visit. And then he went afterwards. 
you know, Reagan didn't go. The senior Bush didn't go. Uh, Bush 43 went in his eighth year for the first time. So visits are not the sum total of everything. All right, now so on the, I want to make two points on what Amos said in answer to Edward's question. I too am not going to get into specifics. Um, again, I think you can't emphasize the context in which force is used too much. If Iran is able to present itself as a victim, then even what it almost described, almost was saying you don't measure it only in terms of the technical setback, but you won't even, you, you'll find the, their ability to reconstitute is very different if they're able to present themselves as the victim. The imagery that somehow force was used before uh, the diplomacy was credibly exhausted. It's critical not to allow them to put themselves in that position. That's one of the reasons I was saying before, there should be preparatory work even now to sort of say, all right, you know, what are the thresholds we can accept? What are the measures that this is for real in terms of the negotiations? What's the point at which we, we agree even now? If we don't see certain kinds of things, this is a process that is a phony process. You know, no one is going into it to sort of hide, to try to prove it's a phony process. The, the purpose is to be credible in terms of trying to negotiate something, but that also means we put something on the table at a certain point where we can say this is for real. It meets the threshold, basically the thresholds that almost was talking about before. And then Bob echoed, what, is, what matters here in the end is the following. The position for a long time has been Iran can have civil nuclear power. They cannot have a breakout capability. That's the measure. They cannot have a breakout capability. In the near term, you have to stop the clock. But the more fundamental issue is they can't have a breakout capability. Now, the second point I would make in response to what Edward raised was this. When I look at Iran, I think this is a country that looks an awful like, like the Soviet Union in 1981, where ideology is no longer believed. It's a cloak for the leaders. Beneath, beneath the veneer, there's a disbelief in the ideology. There's a cynicism about it. And political systems that have an ideology that's only a cloak face a certain corrosive reality underneath, and it eats away. The one thing I would say, if it comes to the use of force, the use of force should be done in such a way that it doesn't give this regime a lease on life. Thank you very much. We're about to end here because our time is up. I just want to, if it's okay, because there's some journalists in the audience, and I think uh, they'll be upset if I, at least I don't ask the question. We won't get an answer, just a brief answer almost, but uh, there's been a lot of reporting on the front pages of the American newspapers in the last few weeks about people at the top of the Israeli defense establishment. You're probably the only person who has not spoken out about this. Uh, the internal Israeli debate, which you alluded to yourself, um, can you just explain why you've chosen not to speak out? Because I assume you won't speak out. <laughs> I think uh, in a democratic country, uh, you should pay attention to the fact uh, who was elected by the people to lead the country and who was uh, appointed to be a professional. The duty of the professionals is to be uh, very analytical and brave in presenting their uh, analysis and their recommendations to the political level in a closed rooms. We have done it when history will open the protocols 50 years from now, I think we will get high grades. However, whenever you retire, I think it's, you should impose on yourself at least a year of not speaking at all uh, it is very much recommended uh, to do what every Israeli young uh, soldier who concludes his compulsory service is doing, go to South America for a couple of months, and then move to the Washington Institute. And <laughs> basically, uh, not report to anyone, 
not command anyone. And a year of having perspective is, is very important. So anybody who spoke even before he left office, I think it's a mistake. When you decide to speak after a year, uh, you should be very careful, very careful uh, to, and you have to speak up, but I think that the language should be a, a very careful language. And I'm speaking, I spoke tonight, I spoke today, uh, but you have to be careful. Uh, I think at the end of the day, if there is not something that we call in Israel uh, a black flag, you know, the government is going to do something that is unethical to, to command a murder of innocent people in an orphan house. Then you have to speak up, whatever. But if the government is considering uh, a legitimate uh, policies, and I can be maybe in the same camp with my colleagues about the substance, but I think as long as it is, is not something that with a black uh, flag over there, you better speak in understatement. Sometimes it's even make more effective.